Welcome our new inductees, their families, their friends, and colleagues who are with us this evening to celebrate their exceptional accomplishment and to thank our nominators for putting them forward for this great honor. The Florida Inventors Hall of Fame is in residence at the University of South Florida in the Research Park, where the Walk of Fame is located. Being outdoors, the Inventors Commons, is a place where people can come and visit at any time. Many of the U USF faculty, staff, and students uh, enjoy their lunch and study there amongst those great live oak trees. We hope you'll plan to visit the USF campus and enjoy the Walk of Fame. Each of tonight's honorees have credited technologies, medicines, products that have impacted millions of people for the better. They've cured diseases, they've unlocked the mysteries of basic science. They've found new, better, and safer ways of improving people's lives. And they've created new products, companies, and jobs that strengthen our communities. America is a nation of people who push the boundaries of discovery. And Florida, as the third most populous state is ready to claim that leadership. Thank you all for leading us and inspiring us to dream bigger and bolder than ever before. I stand in awe and admiration of those who think and innovate and produce and turn the engine of our incredible economy here in Florida and in this nation. Tonight's inductees are shining examples from automotive technology to medical advances to plastics to robotics, to pest control. The range of human ingenuity in Florida is on proud display here this evening. So thank you all inductees for your contributions. We salute you. What better reason to be here but to honor the incredible inventors that are being inducted into the Florida Hall of Fame today. Each inventor, as I understand, has not one patent, not two patents, but multiple patents for each of them. We celebrate, among other things, the fact that they have their innovative brilliance, that they have committed themselves to bettering humanity, that they have the perseverance to keep going and to make sure that their ideas are a reality for all of us. Our first inductee is Henry Ford. He lived from 1863 to 1947, and all I can say is let's turn back the hands of time. Henry Ford. The Florida Legacy. Automobile industrialist Henry Ford helped to shape the course of the 20th century by revolutionizing the way Floridians and Americans travel. Like his friend, mentor, and neighbor in Fort Myers, Florida, Thomas Edison, Ford was an innovator, transforming the automobile from a luxury item to a practical means of transportation. A recipient of 161 patents, 
Ford not only revolutionized industrial manufacturing production, but continued to improve upon his initial designs and explore new fields of automotive technology, industrial production, and even plant science. Like Thomas Edison, Ford was a firm believer in finding natural solutions to industrial problems. Ford pioneered research in finding industrial uses for the soybean. With Thomas Edison and Harvey Firestone, he sought new sources of American rubber, forming the Edison Botanic Research Corporation in 1927. Today, the laboratory used by the groundbreaking trio, located in Fort Myers, Florida, has been designated a National Historic Chemical Landmark, the first site to receive this honor in Florida. Ford also conducted aeronautical research in Florida. Pilots flew early Ford manufactured aircraft in the state. Several Ford commercial aircraft were named after prominent Florida cities, including Miss Fort Myers. In addition, Early experimental work on the highly secretive V8 engine was also conducted in Florida, according to employees engaged in the project. Henry Ford's pioneering advancements in the automotive industry gave the average American the opportunity to travel freely. The explosive growth that followed led to the modern roadways and transportation systems that we know today. Ford even lent his support to the construction of important Florida road projects, including the Tamiami Trail. Florida remembers Henry Ford's contributions to science via the Edison Botanic Research Corporation Laboratory and the Mangoes, winter home of Henry Ford, both located in Fort Myers. Today, Henry Ford's legacy of innovation and keen interest in research and education continue to inspire new generations of Floridians. Henry Ford, the Florida Legacy. The legacy of Henry Ford lives on through science programs and young inventors tours at the Edison Ford Winter Estates. For more information, visit www.edisonfordwinterestates.org. Today, Henry Ford's legacy in Fort Myers is much the same as it was 100 years ago. Uh, the Edison and Ford Winter Estates is uh, working hard at uh, moving young minds and young inventors, uh, young entrepreneurs forward. Um, Henry would be very happy with the condition of his property and of his remarkable uh, chemical laboratory that he shared with uh, Thomas Edison uh, in Fort Myers. And yes, we have been designated last year by the American Chemical Society as an American uh, landmark, a chemical landmark in America. It's a very important site, uh, important to the education of our young people. As one of the 10 most visited historic home sites in America, we're proud to be a contri contributing part of uh, Florida's leadership in innovation and entrepreneurship. I have the pleasure of introducing the next inductee, Dr. Robert Howard Grobs. Bob was mentored in the field of organic chemistry at the University of Florida while pursuing his bachelor's and master's degree. In 2005, he received the Nobel Prize in chemistry for the work that uh, he has done in Caltech. Growing up in rural Kentucky, Robert Grubbs spent the majority of his childhood helping his father and uncle maintain their farmlands. 
It was natural for him to choose the University of Florida as an agricultural chemistry major, a field which combined his interests in science and agriculture. At UF, he was mentored by organic chemistry professor Merle Batiste, who introduced him to organic research. Upon graduation, Batiste encouraged him to continue in his chosen field. Grubbs attended Columbia University, where he received his PhD, then traveled out west for his postdoctoral work at Stanford University. In 1978, Grubbs accepted a faculty position at the California Institute of Technology. I'm Robert Grubbs, professor of chemistry at Caltech. And I was lucky to win the Nobel Prize in 2005 in chemistry. You know, I, I didn't really know what a scientist was. I, I grew up in a very rural background. I, I, I remember overhearing my parents saying, he's gonna be an inventor someday. Uh, but, but they, they didn't know what, what that sort of meant. It just, I always made stuff, was always worrying about how things were put together. I discovered that I, that I really liked organic chemistry, I really liked working in an organic lab, and I actually had some talent. It was sort of the first thing I found I really had a talent for. You know, what I did to win the Nobel Prize, in a simple way. So what we study are, are catalyst reactions, and so these are reactions that uh, you can mix two chemicals together and they will stay for a very long period of time and then you add the catalyst and then things happen. So the catalyst is what causes the two chemicals to react with each other. And so first thing we had to do was to understand how the reaction happened. How, how you could put in a metal complex and it would break a bond apart and put the pieces back together again. So that was really fundamental work and that's really what we started on. Once we understood that, then all the other work then, then flowed from that. The kinds of molecules that we work on are called olefins. These are carbon compounds that contain two bonds between carbon. Most, uh, like gasoline, has one bond between carbons and these have two. And, and so the catalyst that we work with breaks those bonds and reassembles the fragments. And so it's really a new tool for building organic molecules. The applications now that are developing range from a new hepatitis C treatment uh, and one of the molecules that is involved in that new treatment which finally cures hepatitis C uh, is a molecule made using our chemistry. There are other applications where we're making polymers. Uh, these are plastics and one of the big applications was insulation for pipes that are going into deep sea drilling. So the nice thing about it is that it goes from really special molecules to really sort of big bulk molecules, uh, and it all uses the same catalyst, basically. But I always said I would have come to Caltech for a tent in a parking lot because of the students we get here in the atmosphere here. We have people coming from all over the world who come and want to work in the group, and they operate because they're excited about what they're doing rather than because there's competition. My job at this stage is trying to keep them sort of focused in the right kind of directions and hopefully providing some exciting problems and then mostly stay out of their way and let them, uh, let them go. How often do you have a chance to, uh, you know, have 20-year-olds, 21-year-olds show up in your office and say, let's be excited about working on something, you know, let's, let's try to solve an important problem. And how often do you have doctors wander into your office and say, if you can solve this problem, it's really going to help people. Uh, you know, so it's a great job. One of my colleagues and I look at each other regularly and say we have the world's best job. I came to Florida as an ag major, and, but I soon found organic chemistry. And as I indicated in the, in the script, it was really the first thing I found I was good at and really excited about. I, I tell the students at Caltech, they have a real problem. They're good at everything. And they have to make decisions. For me, it was easy. I just did what was what I could only do. <laughs> but, but, but the key to me was uh, really finding organic chemistry, but was also finding a mentor. There was a, uh, there, there was a young uh, chemist at the University of Florida named Merle Batiste, who uh, sort of adopted me. He was a southerner. He recognized my strengths and weaknesses. And so the abilities that he recognized and encouraged are the reason I'm here today. Uh, he basically took me into his group, trained me, and then when he got me to a point, he said, you gotta leave, which was a real sacrifice on his part because he was an assist professor trying to get tenure, and you know, he'd gotten me to that point. So anyway, so you know, I, I, I've been really lucky to find a lot of exciting problems over the years to work on, and in uh, lots of different areas, I indicated catalysis, and now I'm doing biomedical things. I'm, I'm having fun, I've reached the age where that's what you can do. 
And, and so I'm still having fun. I've got the largest research group I think I've ever had, uh, which I got to cut down someday. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> And so, and so maybe out of all of this, maybe there's going to be a few more inventions in my, my life. And so again, thanks. And, I, and, and it's really strange doing this with wine, because I always did it with beer and Jack Daniels, but go Gators. <laughs> the next inductee is Robert Holton, professor at Florida State University. Dr. Robert Holton, a leader in the field of synthetic chemistry. Dr. Holton began his academic career as an undergraduate at the University of North Carolina and later received his PhD in chemistry from Florida State University. After holding positions at Stanford University, Purdue, and Virginia Tech, he returned to Florida State in 1985 to teach and conduct research. Robert Holton's research focuses on the synthesis of complex organic molecules. He is recognized for being the first to synthesize Taxol, a powerful and widely used cancer-fighting agent. During the 1970s, the active compound in Taxol was first discovered in the Pacific yew tree. These scarce trees are endangered. Bark from Pacific yew trees was required to produce the compound, but removing the bark killed the trees. In 1991, Dr. Holton found a way to synthesize Taxol using the needles and twigs of the more common English yew tree, which could be harvested without killing the tree. Dr. Holton's team first found a method to convert 10-DAB, the natural product which is made from the yew tree bark, to Taxol, by attaching a small side chain fragment utilizing a novel chemical transformation. This happy team of FSU Taxol researchers, led by Bob Holton, claimed victory in totally synthesizing the drug on December 9, 1993. Holton served as Chief Scientific Officer for Taxolog, a company founded in 1997 that continued to develop drugs to treat resistant tumors. Over his career, his work on taxane natural products has led to significant advances in cancer research and treatment. Taxol received approval from the FDA to treat several new cancers in 1998 and was approved for first-line cancer therapy for treating ovarian cancer and metastatic breast cancer. According to a report in the New England Journal of Medicine, Women who take the drug Taxol after receiving chemotherapy live longer. The National Cancer Institute described Taxol as the most important cancer drug in 15 years. Dr. Holton holds over 125 issued U.S. patents. His Taxol was the top-selling anti-cancer drug in 1995 and generated over $1.6 billion in revenues by the end of the decade. In addition, Taxol generated the largest patent payout in history for a single university, Florida State University. Today, Holton is the Matthew Sufness Professor of Chemistry at FSU, where his research group continues to study the synthesis of taxane natural products and their application to cancer treatment. I need to remind you that cancer is really many diseases. My oncology friends would tell me it's almost 100 different diseases attacking multiple tissues and organ systems. Unfortunately, Taxol doesn't cure all cancers, and there's a lot of work left to be done. Now, I tell you all of that as a prelude to my final comment. If you were to come to FSU this week, maybe Tuesday, of Bob's son does well on, on the weekend. And you were to wander over to his lab at about 5, 5.30 in the morning, that's a.m. in the morning, you will find he's already at the bench or he or, he's already at his desk. This is a work ethic that Bob started before he synthesized the first precursors to Taxol. This is a work ethic that he has continued to maintain in the decades 
since the synthesis of Taxol. And this is no doubt a pattern that I expect he'll keep until the day he dies. Bob is committed to the war on cancer, and he believes that there are other drugs that he can synthesize, that he can develop, that will eventually eradicate this dreadful disease. Our next inductee is Dr. Jerry Pratt, research scientist for the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. Uh, my kids are 10 and 12, uh, Ben and Annie, when Annie was young, uh, when, in kindergarten when she was asked, what does your daddy do, said, oh, he builds robots, and teachers didn't really believe her until she finally, because she was kind of a, a jokester, and they'd ask, well, what do the robots do? They fall down. I am Jerry Pratt. I'm a senior research scientist at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. I have been at IHMC for 13 years, and I have been doing research on various robotics, particularly humanoid robots and bipedal walking balance. And I went to MIT undergrad from 1990 to 1994, then I became a grad student in the MIT Lego Laboratory from 94 to 2000, where we were studying various running and walking robots. The MIT Leg Lab is kind of the genesis of a lot of where modern robotics is and he was there at that point in time so it seems like the core aspects of how we do walking and how we do dynamic walking on robotics right now is based on some of his original stuff so that that's part of where our lab gets the beginning of its reputation and we've built on that from there. Okay I, I joined IHMC in April of 2002. We wanted to make um, gas-powered hydraulic robots that could go long distance uh, the first version we made was what we call the one-legged monopod, which was just kind of a test system. So they figured they could start with one leg and get that working well, and then expand it to four legs to make a quadruped. But we uh, decided instead to shift from making a quadruped to making a biped. And that's when we made M2V2. And at that point, we were able to test on a real robot some of these um, concepts on capture points and capturability that we were developing. All right, so Jerry, John Rabula, and Tuan Kulin published two papers in a journal. This paper is a landmark paper in the field of leg adult locomotion that has not only been referenced, but the concept has been implemented on many robots by leading researchers in locomotion. Then from that, we built the T-Bot, which was massive and dangerous, but a lot of fun. Tim Hutchison here at IHMC came up with the idea, and we worked on it together. Um, T-Bot is uh, a balancing robot, balances much in the same way as a Segway, but it can also have this four-wheel mode and transition between four wheels and two wheels. Well, around 2005, Johnny Godowski joined IHMC. Uh, he, he had some really great ideas for running robots. So the hex runner robots and fast runner robots have very few sensors. There are just a couple of actuators on the robot. Uh, you just have a throttle, and based on the dynamics and geometry of the mechanism, the robot runs stably at very high speeds. Normally with a legged robot you'd have some sort of gyroscope on board that senses the orientation of the body and have some really quick feedback that stabilizes the robot. With Fast Runner that just happens naturally. Uh, the la for the last three years we've been really concentrating on the DARPA Robotics Challenge. So that was about three years of work for the lab with a team of about 20 to 25 people at any given time developing algorithms and having algorithms work on robotic hardware. So it was kind of Jerry's dream of getting his chance to apply these algorithms onto the robotic hardware. So we have a really amazing logging system that's taking in 10,000 different variables, recording them a thousand times a second, and four video screens. This is a really powerful tool because after action review, you can look at the logger and excruciatingly detailed data can tell you what's going wrong. Um, it's not just the ability to record the data, but the ease and access in which we can get at that data, I think, is really the key thing there. So it's really been pushing forward the capabilities of the robots. Uh, as far as, like, the science behind walking, we've expanded on our capturability ideas and also on um, whole body controllers for humanoid robots. I I've never seen anyone try as deliberately hard to be a good leader as Jerry. Like He reads, reads self-help books on how to do team management and all of this stuff. He, he like deliberately applies these principles and he ends up doing a really good job of it, despite his self-proclaimed inability to give motivational speeches. 
He does give the worst motivational speeches I've ever seen in my entire life. It is a gift. So here's a guy that over the course of his career literally conceptualizes and builds groundbreaking robotic platforms. That's only part of the story. Because along the way, he literally had to invent a series of hardware and software tool sets that would allow him to solve the problems that he was looking to solve. Forget about the robots, forget about the tools. He conceptualized and, and published these seminal theories that literally changed the course of multiple fields of study. Oh yeah, in his spare time, he and his wife found the area's only non-for-profit science museum for children. <laughs> Inventors, engineers, scientists, much maybe like the rugby players, it seems, we are mentally deranged. And, and I say this in a good way. No matter how bad of a day you have, you stick it out. You just keep on going like the Energizer Bunny. And trust me, there are bad days. In my case, we have broken robots, your software rots, your design flaws are discovered. Your math turns out wrong, it's, it's just a messy sport. And then finally, when you do get your patents into the patent office, their job is to tell you that there's nothing obvious about what you've done, somebody did it 200 years ago, and it's just very humbling. <clears throat> but no matter how bad of a day you have, no matter how beat down you get, the next morning you wake up with this excitement. You rush back in the lab, and in this fit of disillusionment, you convince yourself that today, today will be the day that everything works. Uh, you're usually wrong, uh, but sometimes you are right, and that's when you get your eureka moment. Uh, you break through a log jam, you get the ball in the open, and you put it in the pay dirt. So whenever this happens, I have a rule that I follow, and I advise and recommend this to budding inventors, uh, and it's this. Enjoy the moment and walk away. Take the rest of the day off. If it's a Friday, take the weekend off. Take the month off. You know, Put down your contraption, stop your software, whatever it is, just go celebrate with your team and make the moment last, because that's really what you're living for. Our next inductee has become a very special friend of mine and supporter. Dr. Sandberg, the Senior Vice President for Research, Innovation, and Economic Development at the University of South Florida and founder of the National Academy of Inventors. Paul Ronald Sandberg. Born in Florida into modest circumstances, Sandberg and his family moved across the country to pursue opportunities in California. One of five children, he was the only one in his family to earn a bachelor's degree. As a child, I always looked at things in many different ways. Uh, I was constantly exploring, I was constantly trying to change my environment, always looking for ways to do things, you know, better. No matter if we're sitting and talking about bicycles or talking about something at dinner, he's always coming up with some new ideas. New ideas for the lawnmower, new ideas for bicycles they should have thought about, all kinds of different things. So yes, no matter where we go, he's constantly innovating and creating easier pathways to do things. Dr. Sandberg is also a pilot. Uh, he's a collector of airplanes. Uh, he is a musician as well. Basically, what I'm saying is that this man is an explorer. And that's a characteristic you see with people that are particularly inventive. They're able to look at their environment all around them and spark off of it. So I knew Paul when he was just a young uh, investigator at the University of Cincinnati. Even then, he was a force of nature, creating creating space in the university for his entrepreneurial research, his science, uh, already interested in stem cells to repair brain tissue before it became popular. Early in his career, his father suffered a severe stroke. So I focused the lab on stroke. And the whole concept was, could we help fix the stroked brain? And that's when we really moved forward. Paul caught on to the idea of being able to repair the nervous system uh, long before most other people did. 
So he helped uh, invent that field, helped shape that discipline, helped shape the national interest. One of the hardest things that I dealt with was how can I still have a strong academic career and still be, have an inventive and a translational career. You know, when you walk the line and you're a closet inventor, you can't be yourself in many ways. You can't open up and be yourself. And you can't be as creative as you really could be. Sandberg sought to change that from the inside. He became a senior administrator at the University of South Florida, where he changed the culture of academia. I said, let's have a lunch. Let's invite anybody at USF who's on the faculty or staff, and if they have an issued US patent, or a patent from some other country, come and uh, have lunch with us. I thought we'd get a handful. I didn't know. And we got over 100. It was amazing. Paul is an inspiration and a role model at USF. As the Senior Vice President for Research Innovation and Economic Development, he's been absolutely instrumental in making a difference and raising the profile of the University of South Florida. We've even changed our promotion and tenure guidelines so that it supports tech transfer. And because of that, we were asked nationally to help other universities do the same thing. With great success at USF, Paul turned his sights nationally with perhaps his best invention yet, the NAI. The National Academy of Inventors honors and encourages the translation of academic inventions from the lab to the marketplace. Academic cultures have always encouraged creativity, but not necessarily the commercialization side, the part where you take an invention and take it to a product. What Dr. Sandberg has brought with NAI is a focus on celebrating that culture and acknowledging that culture. Dr. Sandberg with the NAI is trying to redress this balance between invention and research. And his concern is to, is to change the value system for universities, that you can have creativity, you can have deep knowledge, and still actually be practicing invention out there. That's been the, really the great American contribution. Over 3,000 members and fellows, all as a result of Dr. Sandberg. Phenomenal. That in and of itself would justify his induction into the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame. But you complement that with the success of his research and his leadership in research, you've got somebody here who is so deserving of this recognition. Our nation now needs innovation. Our nation now needs creativity. This is what Paul Sandberg has done. Paul gets it. I bet everyone that's watching this video now is thinking, hey, I invented something at some time. It's just taking it and carrying it forward, okay? But when you think millions and millions of people having that approach, you know, invention moves the world forward. It really does. People who invent like to fix things. They want to make life better for others. Being in the company of so many amazing inventors tonight is a good reminder of why we do what we do. It is also a reminder of the lessons we've all learned along the way. Don't be afraid to take risks. Don't be afraid to fail. And learn from your colleagues and your students because we can change the world together as a team. We're all here because we know there's no limit to the power of human intellect. I am forever humbled and grateful to be part of a community of inventors who have defied limits in the past and continue to do so every day. Our next inductee, ladies and gentlemen, is Dr. Nan Yao Su, Distinguished Professor at the University of Florida. University of Florida entomologist Nan Yao Su has devoted his career to understanding termites and how to thwart them from damaging property. The only thing we know uh, like, you know, 30, 40 years ago was that these termites come in from the soil into the house. But what's underneath the soil is the black box. Nobody really knew exactly what's going on there. For decades, the standard treatment for termites was to create a barrier around a building's foundation with potent chemicals that kill termites when they crawled through them. If they can find a gap in your barrier, they eventually they go right back. So that is really one of the stuff to realize that there's got to be some better way to do the termite control than just treat the soil around your house. 
The idea here is that uh, uh, instead of spraying uh, a large quantity of pesticide in the soil to protect your house, we are actually try to put a bait around your house, inviting termites to have a dinner with you. So bait is basically the food for them. And we invite them to come in and eat the bait. And then they would take the, the, those uh, bait back to the county, and eventually the entire county would get killed. His bait and treatment system used small amounts of a termite-specific agent to kill entire colonies. Dow AgroSciences licensed Dr. Sue's pest control technology and worked with him to develop the Centricon termite colony elimination system. Study after study showed the Centricon system worked. The Centricon system represents one of the University of Florida's most successful technology transfers. Since its introduction for commercial use in the mid-1990s, the Centricon system has protected millions of structures, including the White House, Statue of Liberty, and Independence Hall. Dr. Sue changed the paradigm of termite protection with a safer, more effective approach that has helped countless homeowners and businesses and prevented thousands of tons of dangerous chemicals from entering the environment. No matter what you are in engineering or biology or entomology, if you put your mind into finding a solution, strange thing does happen. And so for those young entomologists, biologists, scientists, I hope this is an inspiration to you. I, you know, if you approach your problem with an innovative thought, who knows? you may come up with a solution that will surprise everybody, including yourself. And that you have to keep thinking outside the box. Don't let anybody say you can't do it because you're the only way to decide you can do it or not. And our final inductee tonight is Dr. Janet Yamamoto, professor at the University of Florida. Let's watch. Dr. Janet Yamamoto is a hero among cat lovers. 30 years ago, what I was interested in was uh, working on viruses in general. And I started to work on cat virus those days. Dr. Yamamoto helped discover the deadly feline immunodeficiency virus known as FIV. I've always liked to work with viruses. Uh, I always wanted to work and make vaccines and therapy. Uh, against virus. Her work not only discovered FIV, but collaboration with colleagues at the University of California resulted in an effective vaccine that prevents the disease. UF and UC Davis hold joint patents on a vaccine known to cats, vets, and their human companions as Filovax FIV. Dr. Yamamoto's research into FIV eventually led to an understanding that the feline virus had many similarities to the human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, that causes AIDS. AIDS virus came out roughly about 30 years ago. We didn't know what kind of virus it was, and it so happened that that virus, it was from my favorite virus family, which is a retrovirus, uh, because I was working on leukemia. And the retrovirus virus also causes leukemia. The similar family of AIDS virus causes leukemia. Dr. Yamamoto's research over the past dozen years has focused on developing an effective HIV vaccine. Her lab uses FIV feline AIDS as an animal model for human AIDS. In cats, we develop the T cell based vaccine heavily. In humans, for HIV-2, we have to develop a T-cell-based vaccine. So our challenge is enormous because this will change how we make vaccines for future. Because T-cell is very important immune component of our body, of our animal's body. And if we could tickle the immunity correctly, we should be able to make a much stronger vaccine for almost many pathogens. Dr. Yamamoto's curiosity and determination have made seminal contributions to the understanding of vaccine development. Her work has led to a commercially successful vaccine for domestic cats and may well lead to the development of an effective vaccine to protect against HIV. Lastly, I must thank University of Florida for providing my laboratory the nurturing academic environment needed in generating new discoveries and products for veterinary medicine and for human medicine. Needless to say, I have had and continue to have immense support 
and encouragement from my mother and sister, who's also here today, and who are also my laboratory volunteers. They fill the tips. <laughs> if my father was here today, he would have been very proud as he encouraged creativity and, and encouraged me to create products, especially to benefit the world. I sincerely thank everyone who is here today and to all who contributed to making it possible for me to be here. Thank you.